Hello there, my fellow Inner Sphere citizens, and welcome back to some Battletech lore. Today's topic is another one of those standalone pillars of Battletech lore and technology, namely how space travel works in this setting. I would have done this video a long time ago, but at the time I was afraid that you would find it all kind of boring. Nevertheless, it is an important element of the universe, so I finally decided to get it done. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The driving force behind the initial colonization of the Inner Sphere, the Kiarni Fushida Drive, also known simply as the KF Drive, was named after two professors, Thomas Kiarni and Takayoshi Fushida, who theorized of the ability to warp space to allow for quick travel over more than two dozen light years. Although the two scientists put forward their theories beginning as early as 2018, their theories were ridiculed for decades. It was only after their deaths that they were vindicated, when the Deimos project would jump the first jump ship from Sol's Zenith jump point to its Nadir jump point in 2107. Just one year later, the TAS Pathfinder made the very first manned interstellar jump to Tau Ceti where they confirmed the findings of earlier slower-than-light Magellan probes, that Tau Ceti had a habitable planet, which would later be known as New Earth. The KF drive itself is comprised of a meters-thick core made of a titanium-germanium alloy wrapped in a liquid helium jacket, a controller, an initiator, tankage, and other associated equipment. The core acts as a capacitor to store the energy required for the jump, Replacement cores cannot be transported through hyperspace, more on that in a few minutes. There are two ways to deliver a core to a different star system. The first is the most common, when the appropriate transport assets are available, once constructed or removed from the previous hull, the core is attached to a complete drive and installed within a lightweight transport shell. Another jump ship would then temporarily attach itself in order to provide the necessary charge and to program the jump through hyperspace. After the charging ship has removed itself to a safe distance, the shell would then jump to the target location. The second method would have the titanium-germanium core ground into gravel-sized particles and chemically treated to reduce the interference with a functional KF drive. It would then be reprocessed in a zero-g facility and recast into a new core, a process that does require multiple months. The science behind the KF drive was lost in the course of the succession wars, except by Comstar who concealed their continued knowledge. This also meant that new jumpship designs could only be created by trial and error, a process which was ridiculously expensive. Comstar did secretly produce a few new designs, most notably the Magellan-class explorer, equipped with an HPG for use in scouting new systems in searching for Alexander Kerensky's fleet. After the discovery of the famous Helm memory core, the science did begin to recover though, and new designs would eventually begin to be produced again. The clans retained a bit more of this information, although how much they did was a closely guarded secret. And so we arrive at the process of jump itself. In order to jump safely, a jump ship must operate within a zone where gravitational influences drop below the critical level for the hyperspace field of the KF drive to form properly. These zones are somewhat inaccurately referred to as jump points. Typically, a jump ship remains at a valid jump point at all times, but some irregular jump points are of a transient nature and could vanish. In that case, the jump ship has to wait until the jump point reappears or move to another jump point otherwise it cannot jump. The origin and destination of a jump can only be another jump point, although the destination may be any jump point within range, even very close ones. It is in fact a well-known maneuver, although rarely attempted, to jump from one star system's jump point to another. The maximum jump range for a KF drive is supposed to be about 30 light years, although there are examples of single jumps covering slightly larger distances. In addition, accidental, bizarre misjumps have been known to move ships hundreds of light years at once, and possibly even more. 
There is also experimental jump drives which may cover distances longer than 30 light years, but none of these is entirely safe to use. Navigators will usually target the standard jump points on the proximity limit above and below the poles of the star as defined by the system's planes of the ecliptic. These are called the Zenith and Nadir jump points. These minimize the influence of the planetary gravity on jump calculation, making them relatively safe and easy to use. While other, non-standard jump points do exist in a star system, these are often of a transitory nature and quite often risky to use. The ship's navigator has to feed the navigational calculations into the drive controller. The calculations may take anywhere from 10 minutes to 12 hours, depending on the circumstance. They usually only take a few minutes when jumps are performed between standard jump points and are made using the jump ship's navigational computer. Jumps to non-standard jump points can take many hours and are much more likely to cause a misjump. If a proper connection cannot be confirmed, the KF drive controller normally prevents or aborts a jump attempt. Although not technically a necessity for jumping, the jump ship should also have its sail furled and confirm that no other vessel is within 27 kilometers, for safety reasons when executing a jump. When the jump program is initiated, it becomes impossible to abort the process except by the safety systems of the drive itself. Within a few minutes of firing the KF drive, warning klaxons will announce the impending jump and seconds later, the KF field expands around the ship and the attached dropships, if any. Although a jump may seem instantaneous, it can take several seconds depending on the distance traveled and the combined mass of all vessels. The presence of a KF drive coil, even a damaged one within a certain proximity, will inhibit the formation of a KF field. Thus, it is impossible to move a fully assembled KF drive as cargo or to recover a stranded jump ship. Unless they elect to scrap their drive coil, jump ships have to jump under their own power. The KF field only correctly encompasses objects within the jump ship or a drop ship that is properly connected by KFFC booms and may slice through or mangle objects which are not fully encompassed. Firing the drive would cause tidal stresses which can be felt up to 27 kilometers away from the jump ship. It is also possible to jump the ship while moving. A jump ship is not required to be stationary relative to the jump point. That is especially important for warships, as it allows them to jump even while maneuvering under full thrust. Passengers will typically suffer some mild dizziness from jumping, while others may suffer serious nausea even a couple of hours later. Damage components of a KF drive may cause the jump attempt to fail, usually because the safety systems abort the jump when the hyperspace field forms improperly. In case of a particularly abrupt abort, the KF drive may become damaged as a result, leaving the ship stranded at the origin point. When they materialize at their destination point, whether or not it was the intended destination of the jump, the jump ship causes tidal stresses similar to those caused when jumping out. It will advertise the presence with an electromagnetic pulse, which can be detected billions of kilometers away, and an infrared signature that can be detected from a relatively closer range of up to 50,000 kilometers. Together, these are called the emergence signature, and are determined by the total mass of the jump ship and its attached dropships. It is even possible to assess the mass or size of an arriving jump ship purely by the emergence signature. After the jump, the KF drive has to be recharged, which is a slow and delicate process. The most common way for the jump ship is to turn towards the local sun and deploy the jump sail, essentially a huge solar collector resembling a parachute. Station keeping thrusters will allow the vessel to maintain its position at the jump point and counter any downward drift towards the local star. In this way, the jump drive can be recharged in 6 to 9 days, depending on the spectral class of the star. An alternative to the jump sail is to recharge the drive with the ship's power plant, but the delicate machinery of the KF drive will make this solution only an emergency one. Some jump ships are equipped with a lithium fusion battery which provides a second charge right away. The battery can be charged separately from the jump drive in the same way as the drive itself. 
almost all the standard jump points back in the day used to feature so-called recharging stations, but many of these were destroyed in the course of the succession wars. Recharge stations can transfer power to a jump ship if it is docked or via cable, or by beaming it at a jump sail of the vessel for collection. This microwave transfer will still require about 176 hours to fully charge the drive to avoid the KF drive damage. However, recharging can be shortened if the jump ship is docked or has a physical connection via cable. When recharging is complete, the vessel is ready to jump again. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the indispensable Kiarni Fushida drive and how the process of space travel works in the universe of Battletech. I am sorry I didn't have many more pictures to illustrate the entire process. Quite a lot of technobabble, to be certain, but, to its credit, I do think it has the flavor of hard science, which makes it, in my opinion, a lot more realistic. Well, compared to things like Warhammer 40k, anyway. What about you, though? Did you know about the Kiani Fushida drive and how it worked? Hopefully, even if you probably heard about it before, now you know a bit more about how it operates. If you enjoyed the episode or found it informative, please click the like, share and subscribe buttons for future content. Thanks for watching and have an awesome day.